So let's look at something else that you examined in your presentation and looking at surveillance and its benefits, and that's the flu, uh, which uh, people in the media are very focused on uh, uh, every October. Uh, what happens when we predict a flu epidemic? How do you approach various aspects of a looming pandemic? Well, uh, it starts off with by looking always, we're constantly looking for new variety strains of influenza, ones that have adapted or be evolved through the connection of pigs, avian bird flu that your listeners and uh, viewers have probably heard about out of China, places like that, and we're humans. So with the intersection of humans, pigs, and chickens, the pigs act as a mixing bowl. They take in both human strains, chicken strains, mix it up and produce uh, strains that are adapted to both pigs and humans. And this is exactly what happened in 2009. We had a strain that came out of pigs that was adapted to humans, and it wasn't a strain that we'd ever seen before. We'd never vaccinated against it before, and humans, by and large, had never seen it before, except, funny enough, in 2009, people over 65 had seen a similar strain way back in the late 1950s, oh. which made them quite immune. 30 to 40 percent had enough That's an interesting outcome. Okay. Yes, it, it was, and one, again, surveillance, public health, never assume that you know that everything's all old hat and just a repeat of history. Uh, if anybody had told me before 2009 that the next pandemic was going to be caused by a strain to which people over 65, at least a large portion of them, were going to be naturally immune, I would say, you're crazy. It is not possible. I've never seen it before. But nature has a habit of throwing us things that we've never seen before. And tangentially, I understand that they recently tried to revive, I think it was a 1919 uh, flu strain, That's right. uh, because as you say, there's a possibility of uh, this happening again. And um, why is it difficult to measure the severity of, of a flu outbreak? Well, if you, you very often think about it this, Barry, even if you get flu and you wake up in the morning, you don't feel well, well, you know, do you want to go to the doctor? Well, you know, perhaps it's, you don't you know you're not feeling well, but you know, going to the doctor is a hassle to get an appointment and you've got to go there. And, and quite frankly, it's no need to panic and the doctor hasn't told you in the past, you know, if you have influenza-like conditions come in immediately. There are some people, uh, people with pre-existing medical conditions. For example, if you have emphysema or asthma, a heart-lung condition, diabetes, all those people should be very careful every time they get flu-like symptoms, whether it's flu that's causing it or any other other pathogen. They need to uh, be very take extra care of themselves and be very proactive in seeking medical care because those kind of people are two to ten times more likely to go to the doctor, end up in hospital, or even regrettably die because of those pre-existing medical conditions. But for those of us who don't come, uh, you are right. dealing with an issue of under-reporting. Under and, and you compensate, you have a rule of thumb. Well, we, one of the things that we did in 2009 through surveillance, through active shoe leather surveillance by go, literally going having a, a survey and doing special studies bef at the very beginning of the pandemic, literally going door to door in some communities, asking people, did they have flu, did they get tested, taking samples, checking it out. We did develop those sort of rule of thumbs multipliers uh, based on hospitalizations. For example, we found that for every hospitalized person, there were approximately 225 uh, real cases of uh, ambulatory outpatient type mm -hmm. flu, of which about half 50% of them would never go near the healthcare system. They would stay at home and self-medicate uh, mm -hmm. over the counter drugs, stay at home, stay out of contact with other people so they don't spread the flu, a uh, box of Kleenex, a lot of liquids, of course, just like the doctor says, and watch whatever TV talk show they like to do. <laughs> right. but, but, you know, you're, you're off the radar from public health because you've not reported and we don't know. So this was a successful campaign? The, this, this was successful in terms of recording. What we did with surveillance was starting off at the shoe level and then using a lot of modeling ex and extensions. We were able to do something that we'd never done before in the U.S. We were able to provide near real-time estimates of the number of cases hospitalization and deaths broken down into three age groups. Once a month we came up with an update, was put on the web, and this allowed not only the leadership and the public health, but everybody who was interested, and the press did take a lot of interest, could go to our website, get the numbers, there would be a description of the methodology so that everybody understood the limits and the strengths and weaknesses, and that I think is very important. Nothing's perfect in this world when you're collecting this kind of data, and a lot of it we used markers or sentinel sites, we didn't survey across everybody, but we had 10 marker sites uh, that cover perhaps about 15 million people that measured the rate of hospitalization and we took those numbers and extrapolated and we explained all of this and said based on these data we think the estimate of the number of cases, hospitalizations and
different tests every month is this. We follow and, and, that, and that let you develop uh, the amount of the amount of treatment that you would need, medications right, and right, so right, forth. Right. Certainly so this, there's different uh, things that you were allowed to develop ahead of time, that's right. and having done the surveillance. And it gave leadership and the public, equal, very important for the public, to have a reality check about what's going on, how bad is it. Uh, it was December 2009, surely the pandemic's over, I don't need to get vaccinated. No, if you read our latest report, there's still cases occurring. And in fact, we had a very interesting debate <coughs> and discussion uh, after the Christmas sort of breaks, holidays, would we still, should we still continue the vaccination program? And, um, you know, we said, well, there probably won't be a big upsurge in most of America, but we can't guarantee that outbreaks wouldn't occur in smaller communities. And that's, ex in fact, exactly what happened. Uh, I used an example of Macon in Georgia. I said, well, I can talk about perhaps there won't be a big blimp of cases after the holidays in Georgia, but a city like Macon could ha experience a small outbreak, and that's exactly what happened. I just got lucky it wasn't. Mm -hmm. I just happened to use them as an example. So there's an example of understanding the limits of what we know and telling our leadership and said, well, we don't think there's going to be a big outbreak, but we can't guarantee. And here's why we, what we can guarantee, and here's why we can't guarantee anymore. And that led to some decisions about to continue the vaccination program after the uh, holiday break, and that was a good call because there were cases afterwards. That's all the time we have today. We've been talking with Dr. Martin I. Meltzer of the CDC. Dr. Meltzer, thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you, Barry. And thank you for listening to Informs Today, a podcast by the Institute for Operations Research and the Management Sciences. For more information about analytics, operations, research, and the series, visit us on the web at www.informs.org. Good day, and remember, keep on crunching those numbers.